Thanks for joining us. So uh, we kind of want to make this a little bit fun because I think the most exciting thing in sales is to make fun of salespeople, right? Because we, we do a lot of dumb things. But we got awesome brands here. So Outreach, Node.io, we've got Lucidchart, um, Slack, and Fastly. So I'm going to start by just going this way and letting these practitioners, which I think is what's great, you're going to hear people that are actually practitioners that are doing exactly what you're doing, and they're going to be able to give you their insights. So I'm going to start with you. All right. So I am Emily Garza. Um, I have a background in direct sales, uh, both inside and outside. I then moved over to Fastly about three years ago to start the enablement function there. Um, I did that for about a year and a half and then launched our customer success function. I'm Andrew Mewborn. I actually have a background in uh, electrical engineering. And I saw this uh, small startup over in Seattle with 20 people and uh, about three years ago and said, I need to get me a piece of that. So um, now I'm at Outreach and pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm a reformed engineer as well, so kudos. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I work at Node.io, where I run sales and marketing. We're focused on customer and talent acquisition. How's it going? I'm Gabe B. Mazar. You guys hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, and I'm the head of B2B marketing at Lucidchart. Most recently, last week, I kind of transitioned into a new role, global sales evangelist. What does that mean? I don't know. Sounds fancy. <laughs> but um, glad to be here. I uh, started early on in the early days of InsideSales.com, helped build that 2012, 2013, transition to higher I was there for a few years, and I've been at Lucidchart for two years. So sad to be here. Hi, I'm Nikki Curtis. Um, I run Enablement Slack. I've been there for about nine months now. Before that, I was at LinkedIn for about six years, um, running our ad sales enablement business. Um, I would say I'm not a reformed engineer. I'm a reformed nonprofit worker. So um, very different background, but excited to be here with you guys. So we're going to go in a, like, a few different directions. I think we're going to kind of start off in a, a little bit fun. So I want to hear your stories a story about bad sales behavior that you've seen or one of the worst stories. I'm going to start with you. I'll start with me. All right, let's do it. So um, a good one we have is as we've grown throughout the years, um, you know, communication becomes very important. And what, one issue we had is we had our account executives uh, and, their con and for my account executive friends in the room, no, no hard feelings. Uh, but they were throwing our solution consultants or our sales engineers on the calls with no preparation at all. Um, and so we would come in just blind, right? And so uh, this isn't really metrics related, but we said, how are we going to figure this out? And so we came up with what we call SWADAM. Anyone know what SWADAM means? It means shit we don't do anymore. <laughs> 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 so our metric, it's very binary. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we case. need one of those stories. We need, we need like the story of the shit you don't do no more. Uh, so don't add SCs or sales engineers to calls without giving them preparation. That's, that's the moral of the story on that one. Yeah. Perfect. Any more? I guess there's the, the modern time kind of all time worst example of Wells Fargo. Um, opening people's accounts without permission, right? Trying to hit particular sales targets. I mean, I've been a Wells Fargo customer for a while, um, got married. And uh, all of a sudden, these spurious accounts showed up when I had to go log in. I was wondering where they came from. I figured they came from my wife merging those over from her personal account, kind of just let it sit for a while. Um, and then all the news came out. And then suddenly, those things just all disappeared. Uh, but I think it's a great, great and very sad example of what can happen when you're really trying to optimize for something that ultimately doesn't improve the outcome for your customers or for your business. Anybody else? Yeah, so, so I've been with a few sales teams that They've heard of the term social selling. Sales manager tells them, like, hey, you should spend a lot of time on LinkedIn and Twitter uh, without much direction, or they maybe read a blog post about it. And next thing you know, sales reps are just spending hours every week on doing random acts of social media or social selling, which gets them nowhere. So next thing you know, you have you know, CEOs walking by, and everybody's on Twitter and, and LinkedIn and stuff like that. And they're like, OK, that's not the best um, <laughs> thing to be on and the screen that you want to be at, you know, especially if the leadership and uh, the management did not give specific instructions or direction. So uh, just be careful when introducing social selling. So. so I think the hardest part about this, because this overarching conversation can go anywhere, metrics of bad, drive bad sales behavior. But if I'm a sales manager, sales leader, an account executive right now, 
there's so many things going on. There's so many channels that I should be doing. You know, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. And now we're like in this age of personalization, which makes this even harder, right? So I don't, I don't truly believe that any sales organization has the same exact metrics, right? It just doesn't work like that. We all have different buyers. We all sell a different way, different channels. But how do you determine good metrics and bad metrics for your organization? Like, where do you start? When you're, you know, essentially you're building a sales process, right, for your sales reps. How do you know, like, what is important, what's not? How do I know I should do cold calling, not do cold calling, social selling, um, cold emails? How do I know that? How do you, where do you, where do you even start? I can take that one. Um, so I'll start maybe with an example. Um, so when I was a young seller, um, I was not hitting my number, and my manager's solution was to go say do more, go get more appointments. Um, and that really looks at the metrics in a really singular view. Um, the problem could have been that I needed more appointments, but it also could have been that while I was on the appointments, I wasn't able to do discovery well. Um, I couldn't propose our solutions. Um, there's a lot of other pieces of that, um, and looking at a metric in singularity really didn't help that. Um, so I think, you know, overall as a guideline when we're looking to set up metrics for sellers is kind of beginning with the end in mind. So understanding what is that, you know, ultimate goal for the seller. Um, sometimes it's quota, sometimes it's 150% of quota. You don't want to limit them to only hit quota. Um, I'd always encourage them to go above that. Um, and then understanding what are those different factors that drive there. So being able to customize it on a per rep basis. Uh, what's their close rate? Uh, what's their average deal size? Um, how many um, proposals do they need to make um, in order to get to that close rate? Um, you can start to drill back to all of the different factors that lead into that ultimate goal, um, and that allows you to craft on an individual basis what each person's metric should be. Yeah, you said on an individual basis, so I think this is a tough thing because most sales organizations, and don't raise your hand if you're guilty, because I guarantee 80% would, you have a, you know, you think like it's like a certain amount of calls and, and you have a lot of sales reps doing the same exact activities or metrics, right? You've got, you're trying to standardize across the board. What she said was individuality. So that makes this even harder, right? Now, not only do we have to build metrics for our sales team, but now we got to individually build different metrics for different sales people because they work better that way. Like I want to get somebody's input on that and how do you overcome that? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at Slack right now because we're, we're starting from scratch where we don't really have any data, we don't have the metrics, we don't have the infrastructure. So um, I'm actually trying to start more of a broad sweep across. So rather, we're not at the stage yet where we're doing individuals, we're actually doing it by segment. So what does it look like for our large enterprise? What does it look like for our enterprise and what does it look like for our mid-market? Um, and I actually think exactly to Emily's point, like it's really about what's your North Star? Like where do we need to get to? What's our lagging indicator? And then what are the leading behavioral indicators that we can actually start to track and measure? I also think it doesn't stay static. So um, I would say last year at Slack, we had all this low hanging fruit of all these leads coming in and now we're in an evolution of the industry where we're actually having to go out and do more prospecting. So now we actually have to create more metrics around what does good prospecting look like. Um, and it's not really to me on an individual basis, it's actually saying, hey, if we need to hit our annual targets, we need to be at 2x in pipe gen. And so what do we actually need to do as an organization to get to 2x pipe gen to hit that ultimate target? So um, I rely a lot on where are we trying to get to, um, and then you work backwards on what are the things that you can influence, and you can't do it all. So I usually pick our like top two and three with an educated guess on what we think is really gonna make the most amount of impact. Um, and then you continue to reevaluate that quarter over quarter, you know, maybe year over year. We're at the stage where it's definitely quarter over quarter right now um, because we're just building these arms from scratch right now. Yeah, so something along the same lines of uh, beginning with an end in mind. So uh, Rob Jepson, he's a sales coaching legend and founder and CEO of Exvoyant. Um, he, Did you hear that, Rob? <laughs> Rob in the room. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what he, what he kind of preaches and, and lives, right, is so if you want to start with an, what's, what's the outcome that you want? What's the end goal? And you want four things that derive or that made up of those outcomes. Number one, you need stages. So CSO Insight says if you have more than six stages in your sales cycle, then you're not predictable. So if you want outcomes, you need stages. Stages then are made up of activities. 
what are those activities within each stage that's going to move the deal forward. After you have those activities, then you need skills to do those activities. And then those skills then are made up of resources. Okay, so if you have those four things, right, then you should have an outcome. And uh, you need to have metrics for each four of those. Again, so if you want an outcome, then you, again, you need stages. Then stages are made up of activities, activities, um, and just skills and skills and resources. So, okay, so let's dive into this. So, and I'm not gonna do any product plugs, but outreach, you guys, this is what you guys help manage, right? So, you know, a cadence, you guys all hear the cadence. Anybody here practicing cadences with their salespeople? So you're tracking all that, we have technology for that. So let's break into the metrics of that, right? So what do you guys see in working with your customers and your internal sales team? What metrics are included in this to get to the outcome that you see are the top three to five having the most impact? Definitely. So the way I look at it is, um, and Mark Costigal, if any of you know him, he, he coined the term called uh, lit, I like to say. So here you have your leading indicate, you have your leading metrics, you have your indicating metrics, and then you have your trailing metrics, right? So um, at the end of the day, we all want to measure you know, how many opportunities are reps creating, how many meetings are these reps creating. But in order to get to that point, like it's very important, but you have to get to the beginning, like what are they doing to get there? And how do we break it down into a simple metric so that reps understand what it is they need to do? Right, because if you throw 10, 20 metrics at these folks, like it's like, okay, where do I focus, right? So um, we try and keep it very simple, whether you're using outreach, you know, sales off, any cadence tools, like what does a rep need to know what to do? One, they need to be trying to fill their pipeline and that's adding prospects to sequences, right? Of those, okay, great. Now when they're adding those prospects, um, are they actually completing the tasks that our systems are creating for them, right? So really keeping it simple for them. Hey, are you actually trying to generate tasks? And two, are you completing those tasks? Uh, then when you, know, you get a little deeper, you say, okay, when I'm doing these, what's my conversion rate around if I get them on the phone, how am I able to convert them? So how does that break down though? Like what do you see? Is that how many, t how many emails does it take along with phone calls, along with social touches. And uh, you know, Gabe, I'll pass this to you because you guys are really good at this multi-touch attribution. But you know, if, you're, if your sales reps know that they need to book X amount of appointments and you're working backwards, that means you say, okay, the history tells us that you need to call these guys six times, you need to email them four times, you need to get connected with them on LinkedIn. You know, these are all touches points. How are you measuring that per individual rep using data? Yes, so uh, with some teams that I work, that work with is uh, in the enterprise segment at Lucia Chart, for example, it takes about 22 touches. We figured out and, and we're big users and powerhouse of, of outreach. Uh, it took about 22 sales touches, a combination of like email, social selling, and uh, cold calling to set an appointment. Out of those 22 touches, right, 13 or 14 of them came from social media activities. So if you, if you think about it, then okay, well, if that's the case, then how can you scale those efforts and then imitate to get more appointments set in the enterprise setting? So we were able to get, go that granular, and if your sales reps or sales managers don't know these numbers, like, hey, how many touches, right? And that fluctuates between industries, that fluctuates between like, you know, who the buyers or buyers are, um, which persona you're going after. But yeah, that's something that we found out, you know, and we're on Salesforce, we use Outreach, we use a few other tools, but um, it's critical to find out that number. Uh, and that's scary for a lot of sales reps because you're like, hey, when's the last time you followed up with them? Oh yeah, the inbound lead, like, oh, I called them once, sent them one email, right? But then if you, if you as a sales leader, a sales organization, you understand that you have to look at your new reps and go, does that mean I have 30 minutes, or five minutes? Okay, um, sorry. So if you, if you say that to your new sales reps, it's like, listen, like you, have to you have to touch this person 22 times over X amount of days to get the opportunity for a sales conversation. Like those are powerful numbers. And if your salespeople don't know that, right, in a tough spot. Now, I would guess at Slack, Node, you guys are data people. Do you guys know those numbers? Have you broke those down? No, I think, so that's actually the work that we're doing right now is what does that look like by segment? And I actually think it's really dangerous to throw numbers out there until you have a benchmark. So then you have managers coaching falsely to numbers just to hit a number. And so I actually think it's in conjunction with working on behavior. Like what's the right behavior that you're working on while you get that data set that you need to be able to give those benchmarks. 
um, because it's also really dangerous to be like, you need to hit those 22 calls and you don't actually know if that's true. You're just kind of pulling that number out of the air. Um, and so I agree, I think the data is really important, but the benchmarks are even more important and doing that by segment, by region, by persona, to your point, I think is really, really key, but that also takes time. And so you can't just wait until you have that data. So what do you do in the meantime while you're getting that data set? The data you have is only going to be useful in the context in which it's totally. implemented, right? So if you, you know, if you tell someone that they have to make 22 touches <laughs> and they go about and do that in the lowest quality way, right, not only is that not going to get the results you want, that's going to hurt your brand, that's going to hurt additional people on your team, their ability to, to go in and execute upon that. So I think there's a balance of understanding Right. What is the, when, I, when I say that I'm going to go reach out to somebody, what does that mean? What are the expectations that are set with that? And that's an important thing for managers to set with their team. Right? If I'm going to reach out for your email, what am I going to say? What's the quality bar for that? How do I measure the success of that? So that when you talk about 22 or X number of touches or different methodologies and, and breakdown of different channels you're using for your communication, right, you have a standard by which you can then measure going forward. If you don't have that, right, then the metric like 22 doesn't actually mean anything right, in the context of using that to generate additional revenue. And building on that, I mean, you can set benchmarks, but those benchmarks can change very quickly. Um, for instance, you know, it was sales development, I'll talk about that, it used to be a volume game, right? Um, and so we used to have early on our reps, hey, you know, you need to be prospecting 200 people a week, like this, that's the number. Um, and so we decided to, and we started to see like, okay, as time went on, there's a bunch of people flooding, you know, flooding the market, everyone's getting the same kind of emails. How do we like fix this? Um, and so what we tried to do is experiment. And I don't know if you guys know Sam Nelson, the guy with the blue hair. He's actually standing back there. Uh, <laughs> so what we started to do is say, okay, let's experiment a little bit, and let's actually say, each rep, you're only going to actually have 13 people in a sequence in any one week, right? Or you're going to be very personalized with these people. You're going to like know them better than they know themselves, right? When you reach out to these folks. Um, and so with that hyper personalization that we've experimented with, it's a different benchmark, we've changed it, and we actually have seen better results with that. Right, so with these benchmarks, it's good to have them as kind of like a North Star, but in a way know that like, that it can very, very quickly change. So what so. you're saying is like, quantity over quality is switching to quality over quantity? Because I mean, I know that there's a lot of probably traditional sales leaders, and you know, you don't have to raise your hand, but you know, you're probably thinking like, well, you know, we've done it this way for the last 30 years and it's worked, right? Like we've, if you dial 150 dials, like you'll get X amount of conversations. And I think the organizations we work with, that's, that just doesn't happen anymore, right? It's just like the quality game is never actually working out. Now activity is different, right? You still have to do a certain amount. But how does, is that what a real bad sales metric is? Is just telling people to do something over and over and over, but there's no real, personalization, there's no, you know, they're not quality touches, you're talking quantity over uh, quality. I'd love to hear like some thoughts on, you, you know, how that shifted the way you guys train or the way your sales process works. Yeah, I can chime in from a training perspective. So I would, I would totally agree. I don't think it's necessarily like it's either quality or it's either quantity. I think it's a balance between, and I also think it depends on role, again, to the point if it's sales development or if you're large enterprise, you're definitely not quantity over quality, right? You're, you're really strategic. I think it's um, more boiling down to, when you talk about prospecting particularly, it's really around time management. Like how are you strategically going into those accounts and what's your balance between research, calling, um, on these different channels and actually seeing like what's lending the best result. Um, I'm a big believer also and like every person has their own voice and their own style and their own art of selling. And so you need to allow autonomy in that while also giving those benchmarks. And so I think it's really important not to micromanage, like here's how you make every single one of these outreaches. I also think just as humans, that would be a really boring job. That's like basically we've automated that to say like, just send out these email, 20 emails. Um, so I think it's really around giving those benchmarks, those guidance um, and those frameworks on what excellence looks like um, alongside the data. So I always think it's a balance between the, the human, the touch, the, the art of selling, plus what the data is telling us. Yeah, we worked with um, a training organization and I think they summed it up really well, where sales really comes out of the activity of proficiency and activity. Um, so, you know, if we want to do a ton of activity, we can do that, but you're probably not going to do it well. It's not going to be personalized. Um, if you want to ramp up the personalization, 
um, you can do that, but that takes a lot more time. So again, figuring out, um, to Nikki's point, kind of what segment you're going after and what makes sense, um, you can find what that balance is. Anybody else? So uh, metrics are really, really hard, especially with all the multi-channel things going on. I mean, I'm sure everybody's like, you know, how do I measure what link, you know, how do I measure the LinkedIn activity um, to the sales process to ensure that my people aren't just wasting their time, right? So how are you, you know, from a metric standpoint, this whole social thing, how are you guys able to track all of that? Or what's the <laughs> best way you're finding to track that activity to be able to someday have that overall arching data to say, you know, that like Gabe said, you know, X amount of social touches, X amount of calls, X amount of emails. Maybe talk about your sales stacks and how you've, you're building those to be able to incorporate all these new things that are going on w without doing it manually. I'm happy to jump in. Um, so I would say, and probably any way that's trying to sell me in this room is like Nikki's the worst person to sell into right now because I'm actually um, limiting my technology buys at the moment. That's not to say, it won't, so just lay in waiting. Um, <laughs> but it's actually to say, I really don't believe that you buy a technology to, as a Band-Aid to solve one point in time problem. I think it's really around, you have to create what excellence looks like, what's your true sales process, get some of that data um, to really start to map out what, what do we want to be as a sales organization, how do we think that our folks are behaving and also changing to the dynamic of the industry. And then with that, I think your technology all, always has to complement and augment the process that you put in place. I think one of the biggest kisses of death is actually when you just get a lot of technology, but you don't actually have the infrastructure or the design in place to know how that carries it through or how does that help support what sales is trying to do. Um, so again, I, I think, I don't know if that's common in the industry or if I'm a little bit of an, an outlier just in terms of like really putting, pumping the brakes on technology buys right now. Um, but I do think it's really important, thank you. Um, I do think it's really important to really define the process and what you want the infrastructure to, to be before you, you actually pull the trigger to buy. Yeah, and I think it's pretty common if something maybe isn't working um, exactly as expected, um, sales just asks for a new system, right? Um, there's a lot of shiny new things and it's easier to blame it on the system. Um, I'm not getting the right information, the leads aren't quality, whatever it is. Um, and say, you know, if we tried this, my life would obviously be so much easier. I'd be doing so much better. Um, and one thing that, you know, that kind of proliferates is just more data in different places. Um, and so one of the things that we looked to do is really try to hone the data um, and bring it back all into an integration. Um, so that way there was clear visibility of all of the different pieces of the sales cycle. I think it's really easy to um, focus on metrics for that very beginning of the sales cycle when you're prospecting um, and getting into that initial meeting. But I think it's also critical to have metrics throughout the entire sales cycle um, to make sure that deals you know, aren't getting stagnant in a specific stage um, or you know, we're not kind of reverting stages or um, even you know, how many iterations of a proposal has to go through your deal desk. Um, you know, is it because we're not really understanding what the seller is actually or what the buyer is really looking for, and so we're just kind of throwing things against the wall. Um, so if you can kind of keep all of that information um, in one system or minimal systems, it allows you as the practitioner to kind of start to understand what are the different trends, um, and you can build coaching um, around that. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, you obviously most sales uh, coaches are doing one-on-ones, right? So how are you taking the metrics and using those in your one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions to make sure that you help, you know, make sure that you can identify a red flag of a bad behavior um, or a trend that you see that's bad behavior that's equating to numbers not working? How are you using those numbers to coach or are you on an individual basis? Yeah, so the way we'll break it up, uh, and the way I've seen a lot of orgs break it up as well is, um, we look at metrics in three different categories. So we look at our reps and we say, all right, what do we need to be looking at daily? Or what are those metrics we need to look at daily? So um, that can be initial meetings that reps have set today, um, initial meetings that they booked. Then we look at those and say, okay, of those that they booked, are these of good quality? Are they reaching out to the right people today? Uh, then we break it up into like weekly metrics, right? 
are they prospecting the right personas? What's their activity levels look like, right? And then we have our monthly metrics. Are they on target to actually hit their number? Um, so when it comes to one-on-one -on -one coaching, you know, I think it's a, it, not a, it shouldn't be a weekly one-on-one, -on -one, it's a daily practice of, let me say, hey, if, for instance, if I'm in a car, I'm gonna check every day if there's gas. Weekly, I'm gonna make sure there's air in my tires, and monthly, I'm gonna make sure my oil's clean, so. Gabe? I know you got something on this. Um, I mean, I'm not specifically involved in those one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching sessions. I, I, like I said, I was, I've been the head of B2B marketing. Uh, we have about 100 sales reps right now. We're about 400 people. But uh, what I do know is that something that has worked uh, really well um, with one-on-one -on -one coaching is that the skip level. So uh, not to deep dive into like what metrics we are discussing there, but something that is, is beneficial for us as we've grown and scaled our, our team uh, is that the skip level either on monthly or quarterly. So for example, uh, a manager will meet month, uh, weekly and have one-on-ones with their sales reps and discuss certain metrics there. But then there's a skip level where the manager's manager will then meet with the, the, the sales rep uh, and then discuss certain metrics as well and, and vice versa, going down and, and, and further up. And I, the metrics are discussed also in those skip level meetings. So, those have been really, really helpful for us. Um, and, and in those meetings, uh, you know, how much pipeline has been created, how many sales activities, um, how many uh, of those demo sets have been held, how many demo sets held, and, and so on. So, awesome. If I could just add one thing too, I think um, really my philosophy is, is the data is the magic. Um, behind letting us know actually where we need to lean in more, whether or not it's on a coaching side or from an enablement training side. And so I think you can look at it um, on a number of different levels. You can look at it on the individual one-on-one. -on -one. So how is my rep doing and where are they? Hey, if they don't have control of the sales cycle, are the, are the deals getting pushed out, et cetera? Or you can look at it on a trend basis. So I actually think from an enablement standpoint, I partner super closely with our sales ops team to be like, what is the data showing us on where we need to actually step in and improve behavior? And so I think it's, it's you can't have one without the other. Um, you need the data to inform where you really need to build this learning infrastructure. Um, and then it's also around coaching. So kind of our philosophies at Slack are building a culture of learning and building a culture of coaching. And I think you need the data behind you to really help you identify where you make those efforts right off the bat. And I think when you um, talk about having sales managers coach, um, we run into, I think, one of the biggest issues in enablement, and I think uh, they touched on it in the last panel, is especially in at least Silicon Valley, um, we've seen a lot of sales managers um, having been promoted from being great sellers, um, which is great. Everyone loves um, you know, promotion, new opportunities. Um, but I think it really falls on people in sales enablement to help them make that transition um, and be able to understand, you know, what are those metrics and then how do we coach to them, right? So kind of back to my story in the beginning, you can't just say, you know, oh, you, you only did 20 touches instead of your 22, um, you have to do ma more. Maybe, you know, maybe they're improving the process. Um, maybe they don't know how to do um, those other touches. So making sure you can actually diagnose and understand the context to each of the metrics. Um, and it's really up to us to help the sales managers do that because oftentimes they haven't been able to do that before. They haven't had the training to do that. So that sounds like coaching to the individual deal over time instead of all the deals, right? Like instead of a one size process is going through each account, targeted account that you're working and you're prospecting or you have in the sales cycle and then actually dissecting that with the rep case by case. Is that what you're saying? I think that's an ideal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many I people are doing that? <laughs> Be honest. Nice. Well, minimum, you have to coach the individual rep, right? I mean, yeah. if you can't do the deal, if you have a thousand accounts that you're working on a month, doing that on an account by account basis is probably a little tough, but on a per rep basis, right? Understanding where certain reps are strong, right? Again, to the 20, they're not reaching out to 20 people, but they're converting 100% of them, that's probably a pretty good probably pretty good uh, situation to have. And so understanding kind of where a particular rep may need some coaching uh, around a particular skill set. I mean, we've had in the past reps that are great at hitting a certain number of activities, right? They can go cold call like a machine, but they don't convert any of those calls into actual business, right? Or any meeting set. 
um, other ones where they have struggled to hit those activity metrics, but they have a convert a high percentage. And so it's really about finding that balance and the coaching that I'm gonna give to one person. One situation is not the same. I'm gonna give the coaching to another person in another situation. On average, do you see talk time correlate with top reps? So the more talk time that they have generally, do you see that still correlate to the top sales reps closing the most business? No? I would say no, because I think every rep is different. You have some reps that are super analytical, that really love the data, that tell the story of data, and then you have a lot of reps that are really good relationship people that like really build that trust. So I think, again, pigeonholing into like this one thing is excellence, I think can be a little scary because all humans are different and all their styles are different. And if you can give them guardrails for like, here's what we expect, but like within that you have your field, you have your room to play and find your own style and your own voice, I think that's super important. Anybody see top reps where the sales leaders like, and I hope we're all out of this, but the sales leaders like, well, you know, Johnny does X, Y, and Z, right? Like, so you should do what Johnny does. Like, I know that my whole sales career, that was what I was, you, it was always modeled after the top rep. And I personally know that that doesn't work, but are you guys seeing, you see, with the organizations you guys are working with, mm -hmm. do you still see that trend? Yeah, I mean, definitely. You have, I mean, in any sales organization, you're going to have, let's say we have 10 reps, right? Of those 10 reps, you're going to have two or three on, on the bottom where they're like struggling, right? You're going to have, you know, three or four in the middle that they're doing okay, you know, they're getting there. And then you're going to have some superstars at the top, right? So ideally, we do want to have all those superstars. But I think what's important is that have like, turn by turn directions on, hey, if you are at the bottom and you are struggling, how exactly do we get you there, right? Um, and that's not just, hey, work harder, but that's gonna be like, all right, hey, I know that you're getting these demos, but you're not converting any of these demos to the next step. Like, what is it that it's occurring there that's not helping you? So ideally, yes, we'd want to have every rep be that top rep, but um, rather than just say, hey, go copy exactly what this guy's doing, notice the trends that what they're doing like how many emails are they actually sending like how how are they being effective with what they're saying right um, so definitely see that a lot and that's an ideal dream to have everyone be that superstar yeah. and turn on the switch and all right now yeah go. quality yeah. messaging yeah. not looking at the number of something that they do but how well do they do what they do right yeah. a super easy example is I mean you know you know, it would make no sense to go tell you know everyone on well now the Lakers but formerly Cavaliers like hey just go do what LeBron does Right? No one believes that that's going to work in practice, right? No, not everyone's 6'8", 250 and runs a 4, 4 5, 40, right? Yeah. So everyone's going to have different skill sets, but you can certainly say, you know, LeBron's going to take quality shots. You know, if you're going to have quality calls or you're going to have quality experience, you're going to target the right accounts. You can do a lot of those things that are going to make sense, but there are going to be certain skill sets and things that are not going to translate from person to person. Yes. Understanding where those strengths are, the things that you can impact, right? The outcomes that you can drive based on that person's skill sets, their temperament, their experience, and their training. If you focus on those things you can control, that's going to lead to a lot better outcomes overall versus saying, why can't we just clone this top person and make that across, uniform across the team? Yeah. yeah, and it's one of the things that we actually build into our onboarding is looking at kind of our top reps and having new sellers listen in on each of those different calls so you get to understand different styles. Um, that way you can start to adopt, you know, I liked that they did this piece, I would never do that, and kind of craft your own piece. Absolutely. So we don't have a lot of time left, but I want to hit on one thing. So um, sales metrics are now becoming, you know, I always say this, like sales is, you know, sales is marketing, marketing is sales, whether you want to admit it or not, what's going on right now, right? There's like just the components are blending. So how is sale, how are you involved are you getting marketing now when you're looking at sales behaviors, right? Because a lot of times, you know, your uh, sales reps taking something from marketing and they're either making it come to life or they're screwing it up, right? One or the other. So how involved are you guys now getting marketing to help you come up with metrics for your sales process? Is that important and how, how does that play out? Hand, yeah. yeah, hands down. Um, I think well, you know, early on we saw like, hey, marketing's producing all these leads. Um, of course, they're looking at sales. Hey, why aren't you converting these leads? <laughs> Um, and you have this like pointing finger show going on, right? So what we decided to do, and um, as you see sales and marketing come together, is create like a common goal, right? So now what you'll see today 
is our marketing guy, uh, Dan the man I call him, and then we have um, our SDR leaders. They'll come together and when we need meetings together, it's not, hey, you didn't bring me enough leads, hey, didn't, you didn't like, do this. It's more of like, how do we work together in order to get that number of those number of meetings that we need. So the strategy right. around the metrics is all kind of blended. Yeah, it's all blended together, right? So it's a common goal. So along the same lines, we have something that uh, our founder, is one of early on in the Google days, uh, he's the first patent attorney at Google, Carl Sun. He um, was fortunate enough to go through this whole OKR program and, and they stand for objective and key results. So we set quarterly OKRs uh, with our marketing and sales teams and we make sure that, and we do our best, that those OKRs are set with marketing leader and the sales leader in the same meeting. And if they both set those goals and they're held accountable to those goals and metrics and key results for each objective, then at the end of the day, there won't be a lot of pointing fingers like, hey, we chose these together, and then let's communicate that to our managers and individual contributors. And that way, um, you know, if, if marketing's goal is to hit, you know, deliver $2 million in, in pipeline, uh, or if, if, or if sales wants to close $2 million, then making sure that there's alignment. Uh, but it's so easy to set different goals, right? Uh, especially if you guys work in remotely or even in different floors. So I do, I, I'm never at my desk. I'm always just, I actually have a temporary desk in the sales department. Uh, and it helps me just observe, understand what are the conversation sounding like, uh, what objections are there um, coming across and things like that. So OKRs have been really a game changer for us. So we um, just recently had someone um, take over marketing and um, we're now calling it Smarketing um, because everything needs a nickname or um, some sort of term. Um, and it's really our integration efforts between sales and marketing. Um, and one of the biggest things that has come out of it so far is this alignment meeting, which we're calling Revenue Operations. And we really run through the entire funnel. Um, so. Um, our corporate marketing team is presenting on what events or conferences we're going to. Um, product marketing is talking about, um, you know, different um, case studies that they've uncovered in talking to the teams or um, analyst discussions. Um, our, you know, SDR teams kind of reporting on what messaging is working well. Um, we're talking through kind of the forecast. Um, so it really allows everyone within the organization to highlight what are their goals and targets and then make sure all of those are aligned. Node, you guys, I'm sure you guys, uh, this <laughs> yeah. is your forte. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, this is, this is kind of what we, what we try to go through during our sales process. I, I mean, I think the idea around common goals is, is by far the most important thing. I mean, often what we hear is one of the problems we go endeavor to solve is, you know, when marketing is saying that they have some sort of way of understanding how important or not important a particular lead is, Right? They'll have a confidence around this. They'll have a process by which they evaluate that. And we'll go talk to the same people in the sales organization. Right? We'll ask marketing people, how, you know, how do you feel like sales evaluates this? Oh, it's fantastic. It's great. I'm sure you guys have all heard the story before. And you go to sales, and they're like, yeah, this is, this is crap. Right? What, what they're telling us and what they're sort of dictating has no impact on us. Right? So finding that common language and understanding ultimately the goal of any business right, at some stage is to drive revenue. Um, and so figuring out right, how those different metrics you know, interact in order to actually deliver revenue and making sure that everyone's aligned to that is important. That's why it's important. That's why the, you know, the Wells Fargo example, really, like it's important to have people around that shared objective and understand what ultimately impacts that objective. Um, and so that's some of the work we do from a technological perspective, but we use this internally as well to understand, right, something that we're scoring internally as like an A lead, what does that actually mean in terms of revenue on the back end, right? Or what, what different posi positive outcomes does that impact and then how do we make sure that the team is all aware of that so they can get aligned around the process that enables that to move from the top of the funnel all the way down to a deal close. All right, I think we want a question. Great, yeah, so we've got a few minutes left. I'd love to throw it out to the people in the room here to see if any of you have questions. Uh, I'm gonna start down the front here. So I'm a consultant and against my objections, one of my companies said, we're not getting enough leads so we are going to uh, put KPAs for our reps to fill the funnel. And that took them away from closing deals to filling the funnel because they got dinged if they didn't fill the funnel. What do your companies do to sort of encourage people to do the touches, the 22 touches, blah, 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 but actually still close freaking deals to bring revenue in? Yeah, um, I would say you need to have the right incentives 
like salespeople are just driven by money. If they're not, I'd be really worried, you know, about who you have in there. But at the end of the day, they're driven by money. They want to win, uh, which is not a bad thing, you know. Um, and we, uh, our VP of sales and inside sales, Peter Chun, is, is really, really good at this. Um, and I highly recommend you reach out to him if you want to know. His name is Peter Chun. Uh, what he does is he mastered the whole spiff and incentiv incentivizes how reps behave, right? Behavior fuels process. Again, that's another quote from Rob Jepson. <laughs> um, so if behavior fuels process, then what are the, what's the process, right? And what are those incentives and, and motivation that it's gonna motivate specific sales reps, whether it's an SDR, because what motivates an SDR is totally different than what motivates, right, an AE or a strategic rep. So this BIF's not better be a freaking Game Boy 60, whatever, right, to an SDR, to an AE. It needs to be something that's very, very relevant. So relevancy in SPIFs and incentives um, is what really has helped us a lot. So you're saying customize incentives to shape the behavior you're looking to achieve. Right. So I guess that would semi-answer your question. <laughs> well, an example, if, you're, if your reps are if they're, uh, getting evaluated and paid based on business close, I can understand why they wouldn't want to go spend time to do something that's filling top of funnel that's not leading to business close. So on some level, if there's a distance there, that's a failure of leadership to figure out how do you align those incentives, to Gabe's point, right, in order to make those outcomes acceptable to the end user or to the, to the rep. Um, so you know, one thing we'll do internally, we specialize a lot of this, and I, I encourage companies, if they can afford it, to specialize early and have people who are focused on a particular part of the process. Make sure that those ultimate goals are in alignment, but then you don't have typically the issues that are uh, that, that rise when you might have some you know, need to fill the top of the funnel, but ultimately that's going to impact your, your ability to, to close business. Cool, thank you. So probably time for two more questions. We have one here, and then if anyone else has a burning question, raise your hand. This gentleman here. Okay, this is a question for Nikki. Great. And I, I know from what, how you were speaking, you're in process, so you might not be able to answer this or not want to share it either, who knows. But you said earlier on that you were exploring what the leading behavioral indicators were. Can you share what behavioral indicators you've discovered, if you can? Thank you. Yeah, and um, keep me honest if I'm not answering your question correctly, too, because um, I think what, it, fundamentally, one of the most exciting things about joining Slack was that it was really in this time of transformation. So we were just getting our enterprise selling arm. And so we were transitioning from what we were calling kind of account managers into actual enterprise sellers. So people that were just kind of managing the contract to actually doing true enterprise sell selling and going in. And so we've had to really take a step back and say, what does true enterprise selling for Slack mean? What does that mean by persona? What does that mean by segment? Um, and, and to be really honest too, which has been really fascinating is that we've had folks that have been in the organization that didn't have a ton of sales experience and have been grown and groomed in Slack. And then we're having folks entering now from other much more tenured, seniored kind of sales backgrounds. And so we're at this really interesting hybrid where we have folks that have some really strong selling skills and some that have really strong background and knowledge in Slack, but not really what is a key behavior in selling. And so what we're trying to do is not, um, it was, sorry, I'll take a quick step back too. When I kind of entered, everyone was like, oh, go, go talk to these three people. And they happened to be the most tenured people there. It wasn't necessarily that they were the most experienced sellers or had the best behavioral ways of selling. It was just they knew the product the best inside and out. And so what we've really taken a step back at saying is, what actually, if we look at good sales execution, who's exhibiting that and who can we really talk to from the front line that we're seeing getting great results, not just based off tenure, but actually based off skill. And so we've taken it through different st steps in the sales process from prospecting, um, first call to close, and then also on our back end from a customer success standpoint. Um, and so those are kind of, without actually saying, here's what we found from each of these behaviorals, because we're still in that discovery phase, we really started to break it down between folks that have been here for a while and pretty tenured, and then folks that have a really strong kind of sales background. How are we meeting those folks in the middle? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael Tuso. I'm the head of business development and enablement at Chili Piper. Um, I think one of the really cool takeaways I had um, from this was the idea of metrics and vanity metrics. 
Um, something super top of mind for me right now um, with training and developing my team. Um, really, anybody on the, the panel, could you speak to some of the metrics that you think um, maybe like status quo where we're at today and how we can improve um, as an industry as far as like how, um, how to get better at, at vanity metrics, whether it's like email reply rates, positive reply rates, uh, measuring maybe on the marketing side for you, Gabe, um, MQ, doing a better job of measuring MQLs uh, to revenue. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear more about that. I mean, basic metrics, vanity metrics, in my opinion, should die. I hope they're de dead already. <laughs> you know, it's like it's outcome metrics and like working backwards. If, if, if from what it seems like the common theme, like what are the what are the major outcomes you're looking to achieve, and then working backwards, and being strategic and creative about the strategy to get to the outcome, right? And testing different things and not giving people the, you know, this is a one size fits all strategy, here's how it is. But how do we get to this outcome? Testing a bunch of different things, falling on your face, and then coaching them through it. Would I be a good key takeaway from that? Yeah, I'll say I, I'm really not a believer in vanity metrics. I think sometimes they're good for morale <laughs> um, and like showing that we're on the right track, but I think um, when you're thinking about your enablement strategy or business strategy, it has to be outcome driven. Um, I also think there's differences between how you talk to folks about um, investment in their performance and their skill level. So I think that's, rather than doing vanity metrics, I kind of combine it with here's our performance metrics that we need to hit. And then here's also the development investment that we make in you to help you grow in your career and your skill set. So, I think those are the two ways that I approach it versus one or the other. Cool, anyone else wanna weigh in on that one? Okay, I have one last quick fire question for anyone on the panel then. So I think uh, we've talked a lot about quality versus quantity and vanity metrics. And I think often uh, we, we kind of tend towards the quantity metrics, partly because they're just really easy to measure, right? And they're addictive. You've got a dashboard and you can segment your dashboard by team and by person. But it's really hard to measure quality because often that requires actual human interaction. And that's, that's hard to automate, it's hard to scale. So I just wanna throw it out there because we're all about actionable takeaways here. Do any of you have any tools or software or techniques or methodologies that you've used that's enabled you to really kind of measure quality and then have that measurement scale? I'll, I'll, I'll start there. So um, internally and externally with the clients we work with is if you're in sales, like figure out what you're really, really good at. So for me, I'm really good at social media, right? Like I've figured out how to start a conversation online and take it offline. And I've kind of mastered that craft. And that feeds about 80% of the deals that we do internally at our agency. Um, so if you're really, really good at one thing, get even better at it and make a commitment to that one thing, you know, using all the other things in your toolkit. But I think I see, you know, it's not about cold calling unless you're really good at cold calling then cold call your face off, right? But like figure out, quit trying to be really good at everything and figure out what your knack is, what your passion is and how do you like to drive sales conversations that feels the most natural for you and for the buyer. That's what I've always found to be a, you know, a key component of that. So figure out the things you're good at and then double, triple down. Double down and that. become the master of it. Awesome. All right, we're going to wrap this up. Um, please, big round of applause for our panelists here. Thank you very much. That was a really enjoyable conversation.